welcoming. Uh, I'm going to start the second lecture of the two lecture series on uh, black holes and jets. And this time, uh, we're going to start thinking about what is this, uh, this whirlpool of gas around the black hole, which we call the accretion disk. And namely, I'll be interested in the connection between the properties of the accretion disk and the outflows that the disk produces. And before I go on, I wanted to make sure that everybody at the back can hear me okay. Can you guys hear me? That's great. Okay, so why do we care about the disk jet connection? Because we would like to have as many ways as possible of understanding uh, what's happening down there in the central engine. One way is the radiation from the accretion disk. The other way is radiation from the jets uh, that extend out to large distances and that allow us uh, to observe these jets and through them uh, probe the strong field gravity near the black hole. So an important question here is to understand how do the properties of an accretion disk connect to those of the jet? Namely, how does the accretion power or the number of ergs per second that the black hole consumes, or m dot c squared, uh, connects to the number of ergs, uh, the energy per unit time, uh, that the jets take away and deposit into the ambient medium where can, we can rather easily observe that energy. Uh, another important question is how do the jets emit? This is still a mystery, um, and it would be good to understand that in order to be able to measure their power well. So uh, what I'm going to try and address, it, if, at least partially during the talk, is what can we learn from the spectra and from the images on small scales of accretion black holes and on large scales where the jets deposit the energy into the ambient medium. Um, I will also try and have some fun here. Uh, when, when it comes down to understanding the disk jet connection, um, at first it was a problem how to make jets work. Now that we figured out how they work, they're so robust there is no way to kill them. And we know that nature kills them uh, all the time and produces them all the time again. Um, so I'm going to try and explore what makes a healthy jet diet. Uh, how do you need to feed the black hole in such a way that it produces the jet? And uh, the hope here is that if we don't do one or more than one of these, uh, then the jet will not be there. Um, so do we need an accretion disk in order to have a jet? Um, how do the disk size, uh, radius, thickness, and the collimation provides to the jet, how do these parameters affect the jets? And uh, do we need uh, these in order for the jets to be there? Do we need the presence of large-scale vertical magnetic flux that the disk brings into the black hole to produce a jet? This was an important question we discussed in the first lecture. Uh, and what about the ambient medium? Uh, can the presence of an ambient medium destabilize or stabilize the jet? After all, it's the interaction with the ambient medium that we see most easily uh, when it comes to jet emission. Uh, so it's important to understand that in order to be able to uh, infer what's happening in the central engine uh, based on the jets. Before I move on to the uh, theory and simulation, I wanted to give a brief observational overview of when we expect to see jets. Actually, when do we see the jets in real systems? And that's important because observations are the ultimate test of our theory. Uh, so uh, we need to know um, how the real thing works. Uh, and maybe that will give us some insight as to what are the questions we need to address. Uh, I will classify um, the behavior of accreting black holes uh, in a very simplistic fashion here uh, by, uh, by using just one parameter, which I will call lambda, and that's the Eddington ratio. That's the ratio of the emergent luminosity from the central engine uh, divided by the Eddington luminosity. That's the luminosity of the central engine that is powerful enough to blow out the accretion flow by the radiation pressure. Uh, so if we are above one, uh, then it means that the black hole consumes a lot of gas per unit time. Um, the density of the gas is high. It is hard for the gas to cool because the optical depth is high. And it means that a photon that's generated by the heating processes, turbulence in the disk, 
uh, will have a hard time making its way out of this accretion flow. Also, because the mass accretion rate is so high, the disk puffs up in order to accommodate the large accretion rate. And that also obstructs the way of the photon. In fact, most of the photons get lost in the accretion disk and either end up falling into the black hole or end up being thrown out as part of the gas and never see the light of day. Uh, so the radiation that makes it out is a tiny fraction that was actually produced in the accretion disk. If we decrease the mass accretion rate below about one Eddington, half Eddington, the exact value is uncertain at this point in time, uh, we are going to get a disk that is different. Uh, th since the mass accretion rate drops, the disk can become thinner and it regains the ability to cool and so it collapses into a razor, what is called razor thin disk. Um, Shakur and Sunyaev alpha disk model is, uh, um, is a good description of this accretion flow. And uh, uh, here, the flow is extremely simple. Uh, the gas, if the black hole is somewhere here, the gas follows Keplerian orbits very well. So it goes on the Keplerian, at the Keplerian velocity, in, essentially in circles around the black hole. And different layers of the gas, different radii, uh, they uh, rub against each other, friction. If you rub your fingers, so if you rub your hands, uh, then you generate heat. The same thing happens in the accretion disks. They, they become hot, they radiate, and these photons um, can escape to us. And uh, because they can escape, the disk remains cool and thin. If we decrease the mass accretion rate below about 1% of Eddington, uh, then an interesting thing happens. Uh, the accretion flow becomes so dilute that it cannot cool. And I will come back to it, to the physics of this accretion flow later. Uh, Charles Gamey covered it uh, to some extent at his lecture, but suffice it to say that when the flow becomes very dilute, um, the photons cannot be produced very easily by the accretion flow. Uh, it puffs up again uh, because all of the radiation is locked up in the flow in the form of heat. It's never been radiated. And we again end up with a geometrically thick disk. But this one is optically thin as opposed to the one at super Eddington accretion rates. So even though the physics of these two accretion disks is very different, they cannot radiate photons efficiently for completely different reasons, both of them are non-radiative. The fraction of radiation that escapes out to an observer is tiny. And so it's actually the easiest to simulate these disks uh, as opposed to the radiation uh, relatively efficient disks. I will get back to that point in a moment. For now, what I want to mention is that there is actually co very complicated phenomenology observed in accreting black holes uh, that involves transitions of the accretion system between these two states. These are called spectral state transitions. And uh, I will show you now um, the diagram of how a block, a representative black hole goes between these two states. So what we are looking here is at a hardness intensity diagram. This is hardness and this is intensity. This is how observers like to look at black holes. Um, and it's also called a Q diagram because of the Q shape like uh, structure that you see uh, or turtle head diagram, which clearly looks like one. Uh, so. What are we looking at here? Let us uh, start in this very low luminosity accretion disk, well below 1% of Eddington luminosity where the disk cannot cool because it's very dilute. Uh, and let's start out here, it's at the bottom. So low intensity deem accretion flow. Uh, and in this case, because the flow is so dilute, it actually produces a radiation spectrum that is almost a continuous power law. It's very hard, it produces a lot of high frequency, high energy photons. Um, so if you uh, look at the hardness ratio, which is in most cases the ratio of two to 10 kilo electron volt band in x-rays to about half to two uh, for those who, uh, who think about these things. Uh, so uh, in this state, most of the radiation comes in the hard band. So we're going to be somewhere here, low luminosity, hard emission. And uh, 
Due to some instabilities in the accretion disk, the amount of gas supplied to the black hole increases. Once that information propagates to the central engine, to the black hole, we will start seeing more luminosity emerging, so the system will travel up the track, you see along these arrows. Uh, eventually, when it hits a good fraction of Eddington, uh, and that fraction of Eddington actually varies between the sources and even between uh, different outbursts of the same source, so we don't quite understand what sets uh, the level of saturation of luminosity, the source starts to travel to the left. Uh, what it tries to do, it tries to cool, but it does so not instantaneously. It takes some time, so the end product will be a radiatively efficient, razor-thin disk, uh, but it needs to get there uh, somehow, and that's the path it takes. Uh, what happens to the jets during this hard to soft transition, as it is called? Uh, at low luminosity, we see a wimpy, uh, pretty low power jet, and uh, the Lorentz factor of this jet is mildly relativistic. Uh, when the luminosity goes up and the accretion rate, therefore, goes up, we see that jet that is more powerful and a little bit faster, but still, the Lorentz factor is maybe two at the most. Uh, when the flow starts to collapse from this to that, uh, and when it crosses the so-called jet line, uh, at around this time, the black hole starts to produce blobs uh, of radiating plasma uh, that move at superluminal velocities, which is indicated here uh, with uh, uh, the bluer color, stronger jet, and also this jet uh, appears to have a uh, Lorentz factor greater than two, uh, at least in some cases. And then eventually when the flow settles down to this left branch, even though it can do these interesting uh, um, uh, rotations on this diagram or it can have these excursions uh, that make the turtle head, uh, it becomes a very thermal, uh, thermally emitting accretion disk uh, that is uh, razor thin, optically thick. Uh, and there is no jet in this case. Uh, there is just uh, essentially black body dominated spectrum. So how to understand this is a mystery. There is really no single model uh, that explains what's going on here. Uh, there are many ideas, and I will not get into the details. Um, suffice it to say that we looked at this and have an idea of what's going on here, roughly. Um, what uh, is interesting for the purpose of this talk is the disjet connection. So an important question is, does this jet get produced by black hole or by something else. And one way to address that is to ask if there is a correlation between the jet power and the black hole spin. And in this case, a variety of groups looked, uh, and in this hard state, there seems to be no correlation between the jet power and the black hole spin. How that happens, I have no idea. Uh, the jet is uh, uh, maybe produced by large scale outflows from the Christian disk or in some other way, but even if it were produced by an accretion disk, we would still expect to have some sort of correlation uh, between the spin uh, and the outflow because the inner disk responds to changes in black hole spin, uh, as I will discuss later, the innermost stable circular orbit that defines the energetics of the inner disk uh, does depend on the spin sensitively. So how that correlation, uh, how come there is no correlation between jet power and spin in this state is a mystery. However, uh, for transient jets, uh, there was a claim of um, rather interesting and exciting correlation between the jet power and the black hole spin. Before I discuss that result, um, let me back up and ask, how do we know what the black hole spin is in the first place? It doesn't sound like a trivial measurement. Uh, in the recent years, a variety of methods have been developed to measure black hole spin, and they have got it down to science. They actually, different methods start to agree on the values of spin. Uh, they are taking care of the systematic uncertainties. Uh, and uh, really, this is a rather exciting uh, area of research where we are increasing the statistics of the number of spins that we have measured. And now we know maybe uh, a dozen black holes um, in our galaxy whose spins have been measured. And similar measurements have been performed for supermassive black holes. So, what is the idea? Yeah. Do we only see persistent jets in, in the case of supermassive black holes at the end, or not in microquasers? So, the diagram that I showed uh, was for microquasers because uh, all the time scales are so short. The black hole's mass is 10 solar masses, so all the time scales, the dynamical time scale is uh, 
um, tens of microseconds. Uh, so things that will take uh, tens of millions of years in AGN happen here on the time scale of a week. Uh, so it's really, um, Roger Blanford likes to call microquasars quasars for the impatient, uh, which I think serves, uh, um, makes the point really well. So your question is, uh, do AGN make jets, persistent jets, or black? Do we, so we it another way. Uh, do you see persistent jets in microquasars, or is it always transient? Well, um, it depends what, you, what, what your definition of transient jet is. The definition that I gave here, transient jet is the jet that emerges when uh, the uh, system crosses the jet line from right to left. Actually, there is no jet when the uh, system crosses it from left to right. And you see that when the system comes back, it's a much lower luminosity than at the top branch. This is called a hysteresis. And uh, there are a few explanations that have been put forward. If you're interested, ask me later. Um, there's no time to discuss this right now. So uh, these types of jets uh, are probably uh, the um, FR1 type jets. Uh, the uh, radio galaxy jets, at least that's my interpretation. Many people think it's in similar ways. Uh, these uh, jets that are uh, transient, I associate them uh, with the quasar jets. Uh, quasars uh, have a finite lifetime. We only see 10% uh, of quasars that are radio loud that produce jets. And so it actually hands out, boats together well with the statistics for transient jet production black hole binaries. Uh, where uh, you have a state transition um, that lasts maybe for a couple of days, uh, during which this uh, transient jet has been produced. And so if you take, let's say, one day, uh, and then multiply it by the ratio of black hole mass in the supermassive case to the stellar mass case, let's say 10 to the 8 uh, is the ratio. So we will get 10 to the 8 days, uh, slash a couple of zeros to get it into years. You get a million years. Uh, so it's actually... It's actually not that off compared to uh, the, uh, to the uh, duty cycle of, of a quasar. Uh, so I think that these guys are probably the quasar jets. Does that answer your question? Any other questions so far? All right, great. So how do we measure black hole spin? Uh, the two most uh, robust and popular methods uh, are relying on the same physical effect that when a razor-thin disk um, experiences different spins of the black hole, uh, the inner edge of the disk either comes in or goes out. So if a black hole is uh, rotating in a counterclockwise, sorry, in the retrograde sense, so if the disk is rotating counterclockwise and the black hole is rotating clockwise, then the size of the hole in the disk will be bigger. Uh, and if the spin increases and becomes positive and uh, nearly maximum, maximal, uh, then the size of the hole will become smaller. And uh, why do we think so? Uh, we think that the uh, razor-thin disk extends all the way down to uh, an orbit around the black hole, which is called the innermost stable circular orbit. By the name, uh, as the name implies, there are no stable circular orbits inside of that orbit. Uh, and uh, the radius of that orbit in the units of gravitational radii uh, decreases from about nine for maximally spinning retrograde black hole, which is here, A equal to minus one, down to one for maximally spinning black holes. So you see that the area will change by a factor of uh, nine squared, but almost 100 between the maximally spinning retrograde case and maximally spinning prograde case. Um, the two methods uh, that measure the spin rely on measuring the radius of this hole where there is no more emission produced. Uh, and the continuum fitting method uh, is the one that I will describe in a little bit more detail than the other one. Uh, it uh, tries and figures out the size of the hole using a similar method for figuring out how far a star is. Uh, so we'll get to that in a moment. The iron line method relies on the fact that every radius in the disk produces an iron line, um, but because of the redshift and Doppler boosting and other effects, the shape of the iron line produced at every radius is different, and when you add them up, you will find a double hump uh, iron line with the red wing, which is very stretched out because it needs to climb out from the innermost regions of the black hole. And by fitting the shape of that iron line, uh, they are able to back out the value of the black hole spin. Uh, the continuum uh, fitting method is easier to explain. Um, so if we have a hole over radius R isco, uh, then most of the luminosity is, hap is, is produced right next to this hole. And the area of the serene that's shining is roughly comparable to the area of the hole. So we can say that the luminosity that we're going to expect to see 
is uh, the radius of the circle squared times pi uh, times sigma t to the fourth. Uh, we can measure the luminosity from the normalization of the mostly black body spectrum that's coming. Uh, we can measure the temperature from the shape of the spectrum. So we know both sides. We know what the radius of the innermost stable circular orbit is in physical units. Then if we know the mass of the black hole and inclination, which are the two important parameters you need to nail down, you're able to back out the spin from this, from this dependence of our ISCO on the spin. So that's really how you can measure the black hole spin. Now, you can measure the black hole spin for a variety of stellar mass black holes in this method and using the iron line, and then plot them, uh, uh, plot them versus the peak radio power that happens during the transient uh, production, uh, the production of transient jets during the state transitions. And what you find is that, um, surprisingly, there is uh, actually a correlation between uh, this jet power and the spin. Uh, there is an active debate ranging here. Uh, some group says that there are uh, sources that are sitting here that uh, this particular work omitted due to one or the other cut uh, on the data. I will get back to that later. Uh, what matters for me is that there are no sources above here uh, because for every spin there is a maximum power as I will discuss that you can expect. And so uh, if you look at a particular source of, as it goes through the state transition multiple times and you nail down the maximum power, uh, then uh, those hopefully would correlate. At least that's what I would expect theoretically. So this is rather tantalizing. Perhaps we're seeing uh, the effects of the tiny black hole rotation uh, on large scale uh, jets. Uh, and that is perhaps a way for us to probe the structure of the innermost accretion flows. Um, so what I will do now is, um, because these two states, the high and the low state, they both are radiatively inefficient as I explained in the intro, I'm going to neglect the radiation altogether to make it as simple as possible, uh, and uh, I will simulate it. Uh, but before I do so, uh, let us ask ourselves, what do we expect for the connection between the jet power and uh, the accretion rate? Uh, as we measure jet power by the effects the jets have on the ambient medium or the radiation the jets produce, we measure the accretion rate from the luminosity that the accretion disks produce. Uh, so how the two are related theoretically? Uh, I will ask an even simpler question. What is the possible maximum power you would expect out of a black hole? Let's, let's try and be extreme and that will uh, elucidate some physics here. So here is a black hole at the center. This is a theorist's eye look at the um, central engine. Uh, there is an accretion disk orbiting around the black hole. So it's going into the board here and the rotation is coming out at you. Uh, there are vertical magnetic field lines threading the black hole. And uh, of course, the rotation of the black hole will wrap these field lines around so the dominant component of the magnetic field will be not the one that I show here, but the one in and out of the board, which is hard for me to draw, so I don't draw it, but keep that in mind, it's there. Um, so what is the power output of the black hole? Let me briefly review it again. We discussed this uh, in the previous lecture. Um, if we have a pipe of, of a cross section equal to the gravitational radius squared, uh, that carries a uh, um, flow of density B squared, energy density of roughly B squared. Uh, and this flow flows at the speed of light, which is basically the velocity of everything near the black hole. Um, in order to estimate the power output, we can just multiply the energy density times the cross section times the speed, which is what I did here. And then everything is modulated by the black hole spin because if the black hole is not spinning, you cannot extract energy from it and therefore uh, the power output will vanish. It turns out it is convenient to, re was there a question? No. Uh, turns out that it is very convenient to recast this in slightly different form. Uh, instead of the magnetic field, I'm going to switch to the magnetic flux threading the black hole, which is the magnetic field strength on the black hole uh, times the uh, area of the black hole, or the radius squared. And what we're going to find is that the power of the jet is proportional to the magnetic flux squared times uh, a prefactor, which I will denote with the letter K, that depends on the black hole spin, A, and the black hole mass through the gravitational radius. So only on mass and spin. As, and as we discussed in the previous lecture, these are the only two parameters that an astrophysical black hole is characterized. And none of these will change in any reasonable observation of a uh, um, black hole binary in our galaxy or in an active galactic nucleus. The only system where I 
I'm aware of, the, the change will be happening as we observe is a core collapse of gamma ray burst or a binary merger, which I will not focus on here. So if we're looking at a stellar mass or a yeah. So you said you're going to neglect the radiation, the radiatively efficient one and only care about the uh, stellar radiation So radiation is still locked into the disk, but so are you saying the radiation pressure does not, does not matter? Radiation pressure does matter, and I take it into account by appropriately choosing the adiabatic index of the flow. Uh, if it is a, a radiation-dominated flow, we'll choose it to be relativistic, four-thirds. Uh, and if it's a sub, uh, if the radiation is subdominant, if uh, the flow is very low luminosity, then I will choose it to be five-thirds or 1.4, depending on your preference. It turns out that the structure of the disk is really insensitive to the choice of the polytropic index. So really, there is uh, almost one-to-one -one mapping between sub-Eddington flows and super-Eddington flows from this point of view. Uh, that said. Uh, Jim has reviewed the radiation effects. They could introduce radiation viscosity. Those effects I cannot take into account by using this simplified consideration. Any other questions at this point? Good. So let's move on. So the jet power is uh, now really for our particular, let's say we focus on our particular favorite black hole. Uh, and uh, we've measured its spin and mass. And we know what this factor K is. It's not going to change in our lifetime. Uh, so. Whatever jet power variations we see, uh, they will be coming from variations in the black hole magnetic flux. So if we see that the jet went up in strength or went down or disappeared, this is all related to the magnetic flux. So what is the possible range of values that the jet power can possibly take? Well, the lower limit is clear. If we don't have any magnetic flux on the black hole, uh, then the jet power will be zero, at least the one that is produced by the magnetic flux extracting the rotational power of the black hole. The upper limit uh, is uh, less straightforward, but it turns out uh, that the upper limit on the jet power is comparable to the accretion power. In this case, uh, the magnetic flux is as strong as possible. It's obviously much higher than in the case of no jet. Uh, and, uh, what limits this is an interesting thing to discuss. So let us imagine that we start with a black hole without any magnetic flux at all. And then we keep giving it more and more and more magnetic flux. So the number of these field lines and their density increases. So what is happening to the accretion disk that is on an orbit around the black hole? It will experience an outward push. The magnetic pressure associated with these field lines will be pushing on the disk with a force F sub B, magnetic force. Uh, the disk, however, can only provide the force of gravity. That's the force that keeps it on an orbit. So when the magnetic field strength becomes so high that its outward push exceeds the gravity force that keeps the disk together, uh, then the magnetic field will push the disk aside and leave. That's really what sets the maximum possible power that a jet can have. Uh, maximum possible magnetic flux, therefore, as well. And this is what sets this phi max value. In this case, the magnetic field can do whatever it wants to the disk. It is dynamically dominant. It's dynamically important and changes the structure of the accretion flow dramatically. And so this uh, type of accretion flow is called magnetically arrested disk. Uh, and uh, I'm going to discuss this on the next slide. A convenient way of uh, looking at the jet power in a quantitative way is to normalize it by the accretion power. So look at the ratio of the jet power to the accretion power, P jet divided by M dot C squared. And I will denote the dimensionless power with the lowercase p sub j. Uh, so what I'm going to now uh, do, I'm going to go over several scenarios. I'm going to try and break the jets. And we will see that it's actually really hard. They are really resilient, and it's a puzzle. So at first, I will start with a big disk. Uh, that extends out to the edge of the sphere of influence of the black hole, about five orders or six orders of magnitude. Um, uh, the disk I show schematically with this uh, red ellipsis, and there is a tiny black hole at the center. Uh, and uh, I will give the disk a lot of vertical magnetic flux. Why do I want to do this? Because I want to try and probe the maximum power. Maximum power happens when the magnetic flux in the black hole is maximum. So I take a big disk with a large area, uh, put a very weak magnetic field into it, a weak field times large area gives me large flux. So I win here by increasing the area. 
and uh, I'm going to see what happens. Uh, the next uh, stop in our journey of trying to break the jets is to uh, consider a small disk. Uh, so it's only 10 gravitational radii. This disk is likely to be produced uh, in a binary merger, a neutron-neutron star or a black hole neutron star uh, merger. And it might have some large scale magnetic flux. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, then I will go to the extreme and say no disk at all. And I will explain what I mean by that. Uh, and then I will um, try to kill the jet really hard and I will take away the poloidal flux, uh, the vertical flux, and I will see what happens. So let me focus on this case first. Uh, so what we're looking here at here is a central region of a huge, huge, huge donut that is in an orbit around the black hole. Uh, so the, uh, the donut starts at about 15 gravitational radii and ends somewhere, somewhere, let's see, um, maybe beyond, uh, um, beyond Simon's Hall, where we have lunch. Uh, so it's, it's a very large torus. It extends out to about 10 to the 5 gravitational radii. Uh, the black hole spin is high because I want to maximize the power output. is 0.99 out of 1. Uh, the disk is large, and uh, it's all threaded with a large-scale magnetic field loop, so the magnetic flux is large. Uh, colors here show the rest mass density, the uh, density of the gas. They go, uh, the color bar goes between 10 to the minus 6 and 1. Uh, that means that this is really essentially vacuum, and this is where all of the gas is sitting. Uh, if we look from above, this is the top view. This is actually the slice through the midplane of the disk. Uh, you see that the density is, of course, high in the disk, and there is nothing in the hole in the middle. Uh, and the black hole and the disk are both counterclockwise rotating. So both of them go about in this way. Uh, what else is important here? Uh, the uh, black lines show the magnetic field lines. And uh, uh, you can see that they are mostly poloidal, and uh, uh, there is no toroidal component. Uh, to, to get some quantitative information from this movie, I am showing the mass accretion rate versus time, uh, the magnetic flux on the black hole versus time, and the power output versus time. Uh, and what's interesting is that this power output actually exceeds 100%, and I will get back to what it means in just a moment. So let us first. Uh, relax and watch the movie. So what we see first is that the uh, differential rotation on the disk winds up the magnetic field lines and makes them uh, predominantly toroidal. Uh, this um, is also accompanied by the development of the magnetorotational instability that Charles discussed at his, in his first lecture. Uh, so the vertical magnetic field develops wiggles, couples different uh, uh, layers of the gas, uh, and uh, transports angular momentum outwards and gas and magnetic flux in onto the black hole. You can see that uh, there are two low density regions above and below uh, the black hole that uh, contain large scale vertical magnetic field. Of course, the dominant component is the one that's in and out of the board that again don't show. The toroidal field is the strongest one. And this magnetic flux keeps increasing, but this increase cannot go on forever. Eventually, the magnetic field becomes so strong that it pushes the disk aside and leaves. And you can see that this uh, uh, expulsion of this excess of magnetic flux is accompanied with uh, jet dancing left and right. Uh, that happens uh, when uh, uh, the magnetic flux bundle goes from the black hole and becomes part of the disk. Once that happens, there is more room in the black hole. It can accrete more gas with more large scale magnetic flux. The magnetic flux recovers. So you see this quasi-periodic oscillation of the large scale magnetic flux on the black hole. And this goes on for as long as we run the simulation. We've run it for twice as long, and we see no uh, end in sight to this quasi-periodic behavior. So the black hole binges, overeats, sheds the extra magnetic flux that it consumed, replenishes it from the disk, and uh, the cycle repeats. Um, because the jet power is proportional to the square of the large-scale magnetic flux, as we discussed, uh, we see that the jet power, apart from the small-scale noise, uh, roughly follows the behavior, large-scale magnetic flux. And the long-term average here is about 150%, which means that, let's say that you have uh, $100, and you're thinking, okay, well, I'm going to go to downtown Princeton, and I'm going to spend all this money on Ben Spoon ice cream. If you haven't tried Ben Spoon yet, please make sure you do before you leave, uh, if, you can, if you can have sugar, of course, uh, because it's all very sweet. Um, so, okay, but anyway, so you have 100 doors and you're thinking what to do, so uh, you're thinking Ben Spoon. And I, I'm saying, no, 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 wait, wait, 
Okay, great. Band Spoon is good. It's good, yes, but you don't have to spend $100. You can come and give $100 to Black Hole because money is energy, right? Energy is money and energy is mass. So you can convert uh, money into mass and drop it into the black hole. So let's say we drop $100 worth of rest mass energy into the black hole and see how much comes back out. The usual picture, uh, you know, the Christian disk has a radiative efficiency of 10, 20, 30%. Maybe you will get a return of 20 or 30, maybe 40% on your investment. So you will get 40 bucks back and that's not good because if I did that to you, you would not talk to me ever again. <laughs> but here you have an unusual situation. You have just listened to me naively and you drop the $100 worth of rest mass energy. I actually don't know how much it is. It's, it's a homework problem, a new homework problem. Uh, drop it into the black hole and uh, you measure how much comes back out and you find that $150 just came your way. So you just made $50. Now, of course, we know that energy is conserved. So the extra $50 worth of energy must have come from somewhere. And it comes from the black hole rotation. Uh, these powerful jets do not let black holes spin really fast for a long time. In fact, as the black hole mass increases by just a few percent, uh, this uh, efficiency will drop below 100%. Um, but interestingly, there are so many black holes whose spins are measured to be nearly maximally spinning. This is a really important, interesting calculation. Uh, and what it allows us to do is if we in reality see a black hole whose jet power exceeds the mass accretion power, uh, then the only way for that to happen in steady state is for the black hole to give its rotational power. So that would be direct evidence that black hole spin is power in the outflow. Another important aspect that I have not covered here uh, in this movie, uh, and maybe I will uh, forward it a little bit uh, so that I can show you, is that whenever these uh, magnetic flux bundles have been expelled into the accretion flow, uh, you see that uh, whenever there is a flux bundle, maybe I will pause the movie whenever one prominent one appears. Or let's say, yeah, let's say even two. Okay, two of them. So see one and the other. And these correspond to under dense regions in the disk. That's because uh, magnetic pressure takes over thermal pressure and expels the density. So these are under dense regions threaded with large scale vertical magnetic field lines. This is the magnetic flux that's escaping from the black hole. Uh, and why is it escaping? Because magnetic field is light. It doesn't have mass associated with it. So it wants to raise buoyantly against gravity. Uh, it's like a bubble of air in a pond of water. A uh, bubble of air wants to rise upward away from the gravitational source, which is uh, below. And here the gravitational source is at the center. So both of these are buoyantly rising away from the black hole. And as they do so, you see the shear in the disk shears them out and mixes the magnetic flux back into the disk. So MADs are green. Uh, they hold on dearly to the magnetic flux that was given to them by the accretion flow and they try not to let it go too far. Whenever it emerges from the black hole, uh, in the form of this expulsion, uh, it very soon gets sheared out and mixed back into the accretion flow and will be recycled. The black hole will get fed the same flux a little bit later. So that's important for the future discussion. So we have done this study for one particular value of black hole spin. How does it depend on the spin? We want to understand what is the connection between jet power and the uh, spin. And this is theoretically what we would expect. Uh, in order to make this plot, I've run a number of different simulations for different values of spins, and then uh, I, I got a smooth fit. Uh, and what we are seeing here is uh, the simulation that we have run uh, is for a spin almost unity, spin of 0.99. Um, and uh, the power of the outflow is about 140%. So we're making actually extra $40 on a $100 investment. Uh, if we decrease the spin down to about 0.9, we're getting about even, we're breaking even, and then we're starting to lose money very soon as we go below spin of point, 0.9 or so. So this is a non-spinning black hole, and uh, surprisingly, perhaps, there is some power outflow. Uh, so why is the power coming out if the black hole is not spinning? Well, because the accretion disk can produce uh, winding of the magnetic field lines and also produce power output. In fact, we can break up the total power output into the contribution from the black hole and the disk. And you see that the black hole wins by a factor of about five at high spin 
and then the disk wins uh, uh, as the spin goes below about 0.3. So for rapidly spinning black holes that are producing the strongest jets, it's most likely that uh, the black holes are doing the most of the jet production. Also, another reason why I would say I think that all the AGN jets that move relativistically um, are powered, powered by black holes because the only way in the simulations at least we can get a relativistic outflow is if it's coming from the black hole because these are the only field lines which are clean. Uh, the black hole vacuums out any gas associated, uh, you know, attached to the field lines and so those jets can accelerate to really large Lorentz factors because of the high magnetization as we discussed in the previous uh, lecture. Another important point is that this red line uh, is giving you the upper limit of what you can expect a jet uh, to carry out in, in the form of energy uh, for a given mass accretion rate because this line is um, drawn for maximum possible magnetic flux on the black hole. If you were to add any more magnetic flux, it wouldn't stay, it would leave. So if you were to look uh, at a black hole anywhere and you would know what the black hole spin is, I would expect this black hole power output to be somewhere below the red line. Uh, conversely, if you uh, switch on harm and run a simulation and measure what the jet power is divided by mass accretion rate, you will get something that is sitting below this line. Uh, that's because this line maximizes the magnetic flux on the black hole. This one? So, yes. So, if you were to put a uh, millisecond magnetar rather than a black hole, would you have gotten the same, would you get the same variability in your n.c square, which is uh, this is This is a really good question. Um, the accretion onto neutron stars should be studied in the same way as extensively as the black hole accretion. We haven't done that. Uh, how large-scale magnetic flux will pile up around the neutron star magnetosphere. Neutron star has its own magnetic flux. How the two will interact, uh, I think it's an open issue. Uh, so I do not expect the same behavior because there is no room for the neutron star to accept new magnetic flux. It will have to hang out outside of the central object. Uh, but uh, some sort of effect um, and change in the disk state because of the accumulation of large-scale flux could happen and it would be really interesting to study it. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't go that far, uh, but I, this, this time scale of variability is interesting. Um, it's actually really hard to be certain that this time scale of variability will not change as I increase the resolution because it does float around. Um, so this, in, in, this, in this respect, it's really interesting that now Athena++ is using this as a test case for the code because we predict a particular saturation of the magnetic flux and it seems like we are green. So this is actually, I think, the, the only large-scale accretion problem that has a prediction because in all other cases, the magnetic flux is set by the initial conditions as opposed to the dynamics of the flow. Here, there is so much magnetic flux in the initial conditions that I can actually say, I expect this phi parameter to be 50. Dimensionless magnetic flux is 50 uh, for this particular value of spin. Um, and then uh, you can ask, once you convince that you have converged in the value of this um, time average uh, time average value of this quantity, you can ask what would be the time variability that you get. So if I were to trust this time variability in my simulation, which I don't quite do, um, I trust the time average values. Uh, then uh, this comes out to be about one month for a characteristic active galactic nucleus. But no, what about the variability in um, Depends whether you're looking at luminosity. I mean, this, this doesn't have to translate into luminosity necessarily. Um, because luminosity is averaged over an area whereas, uh, um, and, and kind of smeared out in time, whereas this is instantaneous uh, mass going through the black hole. But maybe there is some resemblance, and indeed there is some sort of variability. What is interesting is that, at least in terms of jet connection, that we see variability on the scale of a month in a, at least a couple of systems, 3C120 and 3C111. Uh, their X-rays undergo a dip, and then a blob gets produced. And uh, um, if you, if you cross-correlate uh, these two, you will find that whenever the magnetic flux goes up, uh, the mass accretion rate goes down because it's harder to accrete. And so it could be that if the X-rays are connected to the accretion rate, there is a dip there and there is an increase in the, in the jet power. But I think I'm deviating here. Uh, Sorry, I'm just curious. Uh, 
let me let me go back. No, but this is a really good question. Really good question. So uh, this gives us the maximum possible power. Uh, in fact, uh, if you run the default torus problem, you will find a value that is about 10 times less than what, what we're seeing here. Uh, so uh, you do need to give a lot of flux to the black hole in order to get a lot of power out, out of it. Uh, because the magnetic fields are so strong and the jets are so powerful, they're taking out a lot of energy from the black hole and momentum. So if you look at the uh, spin-up parameter that tells you how the uh, black hole spin is going to be changing as a function of time, and uh, uh, plot it versus the current value of the black hole spin, you will find that even though for standard, let's say, thin disk, the uh, spin equilibrium, that is where this parameter vanishes, uh, happens at essentially spin of unity, uh, for MADS, uh, the uh, spin equilibrium value is essentially zero. So if you leave a black hole accreting from an accretion, from, from this, in this accretion state in the MAD configuration, uh, then after uh, maybe um, 10 million years uh, accreting at the Nettington rate, uh, you will get down to a spin of about uh, 0.3. And if you double the black hole mass, uh, then it will go down to essentially uh, zero. So this is a really interesting new way of producing non-spinning black holes. Um, so what I will do now is I'm going to switch gears and uh, uh, attempt to include radiative effects um, in a really simplified way. Um, and uh, the important question here is, can we get the jet to die here? Because uh, we do not see jets from uh, the razor-thin disks that can actively cool. And analytical studies suggest that uh, uh, thin disks cannot drag the magnetic fields in because they accrete really slowly. Uh, and the diffusion time of the magnetic flux becomes shorter than the accretion time. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm showing you essentially the same movie uh, until this point in time where I switch on the cooling. Uh, and this, this cooling done is really in a simplified way. I cool the disk to a target temperature uh, that uh, corresponds to a thinner disk. And we're going to see what happens once we get into the cooling um, part of the simulation. So this is radiatively inefficient, this is radiatively efficient. The radiative efficiency of this disk is uh, almost precisely equal to the Novikov-Thorne efficiency, um, which doesn't have to be, but it happens to be that. So immediately the first thing you see is that uh, the reds become much more saturated because the disk collapses and its density goes up. And you see that the disk breaks up into thin filaments um, they're thin because they lost thermal pressure support and so they have collapsed. So the disk is really thin here uh, and uh, the surprising thing that you see is that the magnetic flux changed but maybe by a factor of two only on the black hole and the, the jet power may be changed by a factor of few as well. So uh, this perhaps explains how can a quasar produce a powerful jet even when its disk is booming and uh, you would expect that it's uh, razor thin and radially efficient. So this shows that it's really hard to kill large-scale magnetic flux on the black hole and kill the jet. It's still a mystery how, in the aftermath of a state transition, when the disk collapses, the black hole loses its magnetic flux. Here it shows no sign of doing so. In fact, even though the, the uh, relative jet efficiency, the uh, relative jet power uh, goes down, it happens not because the absolute jet power goes down, but because the mass accretion rate goes up. So in absolute units, uh, the collapse of the disk does not decrease the jet power on the black hole at all. Uh, it, it only increases the mass accretion rate. So this is all great and beautiful. Uh, we have simulated the system and the limit of a lot of large-scale magnetic flux, and we know now what we theoretically expect uh, for the connection between the jet power and the accretion power. Uh, the question is, what determines the diffusion in these simulations? This is an excellent question. Uh, the usual answer that is given in this case is that, well, our simulations do not have explicit resistivity or viscosity. Uh, so we rely on the numerical uh, dissipation, the smallest scale on the grid scale to um, reconnect the magnetic field lines, for instance, or dissipate the gradients and velocities. Um, so the idea here is that we uh, try and uh, get as much scale separation between the dissipative region and the large scale uh, regions, uh, like the stirring scale, the thickness of the disk, such that the details of the dissipation small scales do not matter. Uh, however, there is a really active debate, and uh, 
you, I refer you to Charles, um, who uh, is uh, getting really interesting results uh, that shearing box simulation without large scale magnetic flux, right? Yeah, it, it do doesn't converge in its properties as you keep increasing the resolution. Um, so uh, this, this is actually a big, big issue. Maybe everything that I'm showing you is not converged. The good news, however, is that uh, a shearing box with a prescribed vertical magnetic flux converges, well converges to well-defined value of uh, um, flux magnetic, uh, sorry, uh, the very good value, uh, a very well-defined value of angular momentum transport. Uh, and here we have a very good, very well-defined large-scale magnetic flux. So there is hope that if we resolve the simulations well enough, we're going to get a good answer for, um, uh, for the result. And uh, to address your question explicitly, how does dissipation happen? You have turbulent cascade uh, that determines the rate of which energy uh, flows onto the smaller scales, and then whatever comes to the smaller scales is killed by the numerical dissipation. So the hope here is that the small scales don't feed back on the large scales too much. So the question is, uh, uh, do the boundary conditions and shearing boxes fix the large scale magnetic flux? The answer is yes. If it's a net flux simulation, the net flux cannot change. It's set once and for all. Yeah, but I imagine in your global simulation, this is not what's In the large scale simulation here, um, and the question is, is this happening in large scale simulation? It's not happening here. The large scale magnetic flux is regulated by the force balance between the jet and, and magnetic flux and the black hole pushing out on the disk. So uh, if the magnetic flux becomes too strong, the disk gets pushed away and goes for a walk, as you, as you see continuously happening here. Uh, and then it comes back. So the system regulates itself, uh, but uh, in the steady state, there is a well-defined value of large-scale magnetic flux uh, that threads the disk. In fact, it's determined by the ability of the accretion disk to bend magnetic field lines. Uh, so um, basically, the system regulates itself to be marginally stable to the magnetic rotational instability. But I would like not to get into those details at the moment. Great questions. Thank you. Any other questions? OK. Uh, so let me go on. So we tried to break the jets, and we failed uh, by cooling. Um, now let me ask, uh, maybe this is not the situation that happens in real AGN. Maybe there is no large-scale magnetic flux in such large abundance. And therefore, this is just not the right model. We need to consider smaller amounts of magnetic flux. Uh, so we decided to test this observationally. Uh, and uh, when an observer, uh, Mohammed Zamanina Sab, approached me and said, hey, I think I know how to measure the magnetic field strength on the black hole, I couldn't believe him. But he here it is. Here here's how you can do this. Well, the jet uh, takes the information from the black hole and the magnetic flux from the black hole and stretches it out to huge distances. Um, six orders of magnitude for sure, at least, before it starts interacting with the ambient medium. And before it does so, um, it produces synchrotron emission. Uh, we don't understand exactly what the dissipation mechanism is, uh, but if you assume a copartition and make other assumptions that uh, by now are pretty standard, um, even though you can discuss uh, the details, uh, then here is the, what the picture that emerges. Uh, there is, at every particular frequency in the radio that you observe, uh, the emission of the jet is dominated by a particular uh, feature that is called the core. Uh, the jet inside of the core at that frequency is optically thick to synchrotron emission, so it's synchrotron self-absorbed, so you don't see much emission. It cannot leak out. Uh, the jet is opaque to its own emission. Outside, the jet is translucent, so it can't emit too much. So most of the emission is happening right around the photosphere at that frequency, uh, where the jet optical depth to its own uh, photons, synchrotron photons, is roughly order unity. Uh, so that's the core. Uh, the optical depth at that frequency is of order unity. Uh, it turns out that uh, if you look at how the position of the core depends on frequency, uh, you will find uh, that uh, the shift between two different frequencies is dependent on the field strength in the jet. So the stronger the field in the jet, uh, the more the core will shift if we change our radio goggles. If we go from uh, 43 gigahertz to 86 gigahertz, then uh, the core will move more so for stronger magnetic fields in the jet. Uh, and this is the dependence. Um, 
roughly proportionality, well, power of three-fourths. So maybe by looking at how much the core shifts, we will be able to figure out what the field strength is in the jet, multiply it by the area, and say that that's the magnetic flux on the black hole. And that way we'll be able to measure what the field strength on the black hole. Also, the disk produces uh, emission, and if we connect that to the mass accretion rate, assuming efficiency, factor of maybe 10 or 20% standard values, then we will be able to compare uh, the jet power to the mass accretion rate. What, yeah? Uh, it relies on the assumption that gamma theta doesn't drop too much below one. If it drops below one by a factor of five, uh, then uh, the inferred magnetic field strength will drop down by a factor of five. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, here is what we get. Uh, we get the magnetic flux in the jet inferred through this method. Uh, versus the magnetic flux you would expect on the black hole according to the simulations I've shown you before. Um, you would expect that uh, if the black holes have dynamically important magnetic flux uh, at, um, around them, then the, the two would be clustering around uh, the diagonal of this plot. The two would be equal. And you kind of see that uh, maybe that's roughly what's happening. So some of the sources are below, some of them are above, so maybe a fraction of the sources actually um, um, experiencing these strong magnetic fields at their centers. Uh, you, you, can ha you can see M87 is sitting somewhere here. Uh, even though we assumed radiativity efficient disks, so M87 would travel a bit to the right and kind of land exactly where we expect if we correct for radiative efficiency of these sources. Uh, so, but these red sources, uh, the quasars, are clustering right there where we would, where we would expect them uh, to be in the, med in the mad state. So that's quite exciting. Uh, let me now shift the gears and uh, try to break the situation by considering a small disk. And uh, the small disk, as I mentioned, uh, is expected to be formed if uh, two neutron stars merge together in, as a result uh, of a binary merger um, uh, or a black hole and neutron star merging together in the binary. Now, these systems are quite exciting uh, because um, they have been LIGO detections of gravitational waves for at least two, maybe two and a half systems. Uh, both of these detections, the reliable detections, uh, were of binary black holes, but soon as the LIGO improves its sensitivity and statistics, we expect to start detecting binary mergers of black holes and neutron stars and uh, neutron stars with neutron stars. In this case, we will have to deal with uh, gas and we would have to try and understand uh, the properties of this gas and uh, the jets that have been produced. In fact, we think that we see these jets as short gamma, short duration gamma ray bursts. So regardless of whether LIGO sees these systems or not, it's interesting to try and understand what determines the jet power in the systems. So the particular system that I'm going to show you here has a black hole of uh, three solar masses, um, which corresponds to maybe two neutron stars of masses slightly above 1.4 solar masses merging together. Uh, the mass of the disk is about 3% of the solar mass, uh, pretty standard value. The spin of the black hole is essentially determined by the orbital motion of the neutron stars and uh, essentially fixed to 0.8, you will get 0.8 reliably. And then we chose a magnetic field strength, uh, which is rather strong for illustration uh, purposes, 10 to the 15 gauss. Uh, but the results are similar for other values of magnetic field strength. And uh, here the color shows the rest mass density in units of um, uh, grams per centimeter cube. So if we look at what happens to the system before I show you the movie, uh, uh, we see that, so first of all, here is the power in x per second as a function of time uh, in seconds. So this is 1% uh, percent of a second, 0 0.01 second, this is 0.1 second, this is 1 second, and the power goes between 10 to the 50 and 10 to the 54 orcs per second. 10 to the 54 orcs per second, it's basically one solar mass a second, uh, which is a characteristic mass accretion rate in a gum ray burst. Uh, so uh, the accretion power starts at about one solar mass a second and then falls off as a power law. Uh, the jet power is roughly constant and we will see in a second why. And the total outflow power uh, is about 10% of the, 
of the accretion power. It's mostly uh, heavily mass-loaded outflow from the disk. Interestingly, uh, the magnetization parameter of the black hole or the ratio of the magnetic flux on the black hole to the MAD level um, exceeds one uh, at a fraction of a second. So somehow, even though this disk is very small and contains very little amount of magnetic flux, it still manages to develop dynamically important magnetic field lines at the center. So let's see how that, how that happens. Let me run the movie. The movie will start out slow and then it will accelerate because I need to evolve over uh, five uh, orders of magnitude in time. So I zoom out to about 1,000 gravitational radii. And then uh, from now on, I will not zoom out. I will let the disk uh, do its thing. And you will see the disk viscously expands. So one interesting thing that you see here is that even though the disk was small, now it's huge after just one second, which is roughly the duration of a short gamma ray burst. And because it has spread out so much, uh, it now can collimate the jets into maybe open angle of about um, um, 10 degrees or so, uh, 0.1 radian, which is a characteristic open angle for a short gamma ray burst, as we infer from observations. Um, and because the disk spread out so much, most of its gas into either end up in the black hole or um, went out to infinity, uh, which means that the mass supply goes down on the black hole. But the magnetic field, and if you were uh, careful, you would see that the amount of magnetic field lines on the black hole didn't change by much. This reflects the fact that the jet power stayed constant. Whatever we put initially into the disk ended up on the black hole and stayed. So the magnetic scale stays the same, but the mass scale goes down. So eventually the two will meet, uh, and that's when the magnetic fields will become dynamically important. In fact, beyond this moment, the jet power will start going down and following the mass accretion rate, the mass accretion power. And this is what could be responsible for switching off uh, the short gamma ray burst. In fact, the same um, mechanism we think might work in core collapse, long duration gamma ray bursts. And as I mentioned, the opening angle uh, is roughly consistent with observations. So this, is, this was quite unexpe unexpected for me, so I thought I would share uh, this with you. Okay, so we failed to break the jet uh, by going to small disk. Let us try and see what happens when there is no disk. And what do I mean by no disk? Well, uh, disk, at least in, in my, uh, the way I think of it, is rotation. So let us start with a purely spherically symmetric accretion flow and ask, is that accretion flow able to produce a jet. So what we are do looking here at is a, a window of about 50 gravitational radii on the side. The black hole is at the center. Um, the initial distribution of gas density is uh, uh, spherically symmetric. Uh, just like in the Bondi accretion problem, um, density goes as r to the minus three halves. Uh, the spin is 0.9 uh, and there is no rotation at all except for the black hole. As before, I show mass accretion rate, magnetic flux on the black hole, and the power of the jets. So you see the magnetic field lines are basically straight because there is no shear. Um, as more and more magnetic flux has been brought by the accretion flow, it becomes dynamically important early on, and that's the only time when it's strong enough to push the jets out because there is a lot of gas raining down on the top, so the magnetic field has to be dynamically important before it can clear out the channel. You can see that there is a little bit of rotation around the center. That's because of the frame dragging effect. There is no rotation supplied externally uh, to the black hole, so the field lines are mostly straight uh, beyond maybe a few times 10 gravitational radii. And what was surprising to me is that the jet power is really tiny here. It's uh, maybe 20 or 30 percent, much lower than you would expect if the black hole was saturated with the magnetic flux. And then I realized what was going on. Uh, whenever the magnetic flux escapes from the center, it can just leave away without any obstruction because there is no shear in the disk that can uh, destroy these magnetic flux bundles that are leaving and there is no shear in the disk to mix it back into the accretion flow. 
So this accretion flow is not green. It's not recycling the magnetic flux. It's losing whatever magnetic flux it gets. And this is why we get such a wimpy jet. So one way actually to destroy a powerful jet is to switch off the rotation. This is not a very realistic situation because in almost any realistic system, there will be some angular momentum. But if there was no angular momentum, the jet would actually be not very strong. So let us try and, let us try and check what will happen if we were to uh, give some angular momentum to the gas. So that's an identical simulation, but uh, with one difference. I have now given angular momentum to the accretion flow uh, such that the circularization radius is at around 50 gravitation radius. So it will be right here uh, or right there uh, for this left panel. Uh, let's see how the situation changes. You can see immediately that the rotation winds up the magnetic field lines. So that's an important difference. And you can see that once the jet uh, pushes its way out, and you can see this interesting you know, shock structure of uh, the jet trying to push its way through this spherical asymmetric, almost spherical asymmetric, raining gas. Eventually, it will succeed. It does take, time, take, take some time. I, I had to run the simulation for a really long time. It was very frustrating. Nothing was happening. And then finally, we have a jet. So that's a victory. We, even though we expected that there would be a jet produced, but what we can see is that the inner region here with the rotation is very similar to the simulations with the disk that we saw before. Uh, there is shear, the magnetic field lines are toroidally dominated, and whenever there is a magnetic flux uh, bundle leaving the black hole, it's being destroyed by the shear and mixed back into the accretion flow. So this rotation can be playing a crucial role of recycling the magnetic flux back into the accretion flow, preventing it from buoyantly ra raising and leaving the system forever. And you can see that eventually the uh, power of the jet settles down to just uh, just under 100%, which is what we would expect for this black hole spin. So rotation can be a crucial um, factor. Disk needs to rotate in order for the jets to be successful. I also tried a circularization radius of 10 gravitational radii, and that was not enough. So you need to have it between 10 and 50 or, or more in order for uh, the jets to reach the maximum possible power. Um, maybe there are some interesting applications to the galactic center if uh, the angular momenta from the stars get canceled out really well, which probably is not realistic, but just putting it out there, uh, maybe this can explain why there is no strong jet, even though there's, in principle, uh, a large reservoir of magnetic flux from stellar winds. So let me switch to the last part, where I try to kill the jet using the most radical means available. I'm going to take uh, its most important food, which is the vertical magnetic flux. The standard, um, the standard picture of um, what's needed for jet production is precisely the vertical magnetic flux, because this is what the black hole gets once the disk transports it to the black hole. It's, uh, it twists it uh, by the rotation of the space-time, as I discussed, and that's how the jet gets produced. Uh, and uh, in a variety of works previously, it was shown that when there is no large-scale magnetic flux, uh, then there will be a uh, vertical magnetic flux. There will be no jet, or there will be very weak jet. Um, if there is no large-scale magnetic flux, is there a way to make it? And there are ways. Uh, one of these ways is uh, re called alpha omega dynamo that I'm going to explain in just a moment. Uh, this is uh, coincidentally what we think generates large-scale dipolar magnetic field of the Earth, but it has never been seen in global simulations of accretion disks. In, in particular, it hasn't been seen to produce large-scale magnetic flux that is necessary for jet production. So here is how it works. Uh, here is the alpha part and the omega part. Let's start with the omega part. Uh, if we have a, an object like uh, the sun, for instance, or the earth, uh, we start with the poloidal dipolar magnetic fields. There is differential rotation uh, in the object that winds up the magnetic field lines and makes them predominantly toroidal. So we have a bunch of toroidal magnetic field loops. And uh, now we recall, oh, there is buoyancy. So if uh, this toroidal field loop develops Parker instability and part of it buoyantly rises, the Coriolis force will twist it and make it into a small poloidal loop. If this happens at all uh, values of azimuth, 
we will make poloidal loops on top of the toroidal loops, and these loops merging will produce a more poloidal field from the toroidal field. Uh, and you can write equations that describe what happens, which I will not go into. So let's try and see what happens in a simulation. Um, the same sort of uh, view, um, the uh, view from the side, the side view and the top view, the same panels, mass accretion rate, magnetic flux and jet power. Uh, we're starting with the spin of 0.9, purely toroidal magnetic field. See, there are no field lines here. Um, it's pretty strong, plasma beta 5, so I can resolve the toroidal wavelength of the MRI. These are really expensive simulations. And it's a really large torus, the same one as the first one we, you saw. So let's run the simulation and see what happens. Uh, the toroidal MRI takes much longer to develop. Uh, it is weaker in stability than the poloidal MRI. But eventually it does make the flow turbulent. You see that the original uh, toroidal field that was going counterclockwise is now broken up and become turbulent. In fact, there is no obvious structure of the initial magnetic field. It's been erased, even though if I were to time average it, it will show up. But in a time-dependent system, it's lost. And what you're seeing right now is that even though we did not have any vertical magnetic flux, we have developed somehow the disk managed to make a vertical magnetic flux that points down into the floor. And it is increasing in strength because the magnetic flux parameter in the black hole is going up. Uh, there will be a drop, and here there will be polarity flip. So what we are seeing here is that parts of the disk, uh, somewhere um, maybe 30 or so gravitational radii away, um, actually at all radii, they are generating poloidal field loops using, uh, you know, through this, I think, that's my hypothesis, I will still need to, ch to test it, through the alpha omega dynamo. These poloidal field loops are being produced above and below the midplane, and they've been accreted by the black hole. So you see, the the actually, the polarity already flipped somewhere here. You see it's pointing up now. It will flip another time uh, as another magnetic field loop, poloidal magnetic field loop that was generated by the dynamo will be accreted. The new uh, poloidal field loop has the opposite orientation. It cancels the one that was on the black hole, and the polarity flips in the other direction. Uh, from now on, the polarity stays constant. It's the inner edge of the large-scale loop that was produced around 30 or 40 gravitational radii. And so it takes a long time for it to accrete on the black hole. And what's really amazing, uh, to me at least when I looked at this, that the magnetic flux parameter went up all the way to 15. If you remember, the MAD level was at around 40 or 50. So uh, without any large-scale poloidal magnetic field, with purely toroidal magnetic field, we were able to produce a really powerful jet, which is about one-third of the way to saturating the black hole with large-scale magnetic flux. You see that the jet becomes stronger, pushes out the gas, and uh, reaches a really healthy level of magnetic flux and jet power of about 20% slightly under 20%. So what is happening here? Um, Large-scale magnetic flux in the toroidal direction is apparently able to produce strong jets. So we tried to break it this way and we could not. Uh, it sounds consistent. Uh, what we see in sounds consistent with the dynamo producing patches of poloidal flux with uh, random orientations and accreting on the black hole and powering jets of various polarity. Um, an open question is whether a weaker magnetic field is able to do the same and whether a disordered toroidal magnetic field or a disordered in general uh, magnetic field will be able to produce large-scale magnetic fields. That's going to be a question for the future. Uh, I wanted to quickly highlight that uh, there is now a new um, uh, paradigm in high-performance computing in addition to the CPUs. Um, gamers have brought down the cost of uh, the, the gaming consoles, and the gaming consoles are nothing but the graphics cards or the GPUs. So you can actually get for the same amount of money a GPU that can be much more powerful than the CPU. And the question is, can you uh, make 
it, can, you, can you make use of it to our advantage? The simulations that you saw with the toroidal magnetic field are extremely expensive, so they would benefit from some speed up. So Matthew Lishka, who is at this conference, uh, um, here, okay, over here, uh, he um, took uh, the harm to decode that Charles wrote, and uh, he converted to GPUs, and it took him one week. I have no idea how he did that. Uh, but now the, this code is 100 times faster than on a single core of a CPU. It shows excellent scaling to uh, thousands. Uh, in this case, at least, we checked it with 4,000 GPUs, uh, and the scaling is really good. Uh, it is fully three-dimensional, uses staggered fields like Athena does. It has AMR, a uh, very similar way as Athena++. Uh, it, it now has hierarchical time stepping, which means that every tile of AMR, every refinement level will be, will be evolved on its own time step, which is extremely useful for accelerating the simulations. Uh, and this can bring an additional factor of 10 um, um, to, to this factor of 100 that we already got from GPUs. Importantly, without any modifications to the code, uh, future GPUs will be a factor of few faster so uh, we will be able to get speed ups of factors of few hundred. Um, interestingly, uh, now we are going to have and already have uh, GPU dedicated clusters like Stanford Xtreme cluster, which has entered production at the beginning of the month, uh, has 16 GPUs per node. And uh, um, the Department of Energy Supercomputer Summit that is planned to enter production in 2018 will also have 16 uh, GPUs per one CPU. So uh, this development is really timely. Uh, let me wrap up uh, with discussing what happens uh, at, let's see, I have 15 minutes left, I guess. Well, let me wrap up really quickly. I will discuss what happens at the very low luminosity end of the accretion flow. Charles mentioned the, this work, um, and he described that these flows become collision-less. Uh, they are unable to cool because the protons, which receive most of the heat uh, in the turbulence, uh, they are not able to talk to the electrons. They do not collide uh, with them frequently enough. And so the electrons that would radiate are not getting any heat. So most of the heat is locked up into the accretion flow and ends up in the black hole. That's why these disks are radiatively inefficient. Uh, one of the biggest problems in understanding how these flows accrete, and it is important because the Event Horizon Telescope is going to observe the images of the supermassive black holes in just about um, half a year from now. Uh, we need to predict what we will see, yet we don't know uh, what the electron temperature is doing because we don't have a good model for describing what the electrons are doing. Um, this was tackled by graduate student Sean Ressler, who is sitting there at the back. Uh, what he has done and said, okay, uh, electron temperature is not the proton temperature. We understand that because the two are decoupled. How can electrons get their heat? The only way for them to get the heat at these low luminosities is for the dissipative process itself to give the heat to the electrons. Uh, so instead of the usual approach of simulating the spectra and images of low luminosity accretion flows where electron temperature is postulated to be something. For instance, uh, electron temperature could be postulated to be 10% of the proton temperature. Um, and then you can make predictions for the spectra. Uh, you can actually incorporate a physical model for what the electron heating would be uh, due to the actual physical process that heats the electrons. And that is alvenic cascade of the turbulence down to the small scales. Um, so I will not get into the de details, but uh, using the um, um, results of kinetic calculations of how much heat goes into the electrons and how much heat goes into the protons, uh, you can construct a subgrid model uh, of uh, uh, electrons receiving a fraction of dissipation in the accretion flow, uh, which we denote as F sub E. It depends on the electron temperature, the proton temperature, and the magnetization of the plasma. Um, we include conduction, thermal conduction along the magnetic field lines. It's important because collisionless flow transports uh, heat very f efficiently along the magnetic field lines because that's how electrons can travel very easily. And we neglect the back reaction of electrons, which are much cooler than the gas on the accretion flow, which is a fine approximation in this case. And we're carrying this out uh, using the HarmPy code, where, we, uh, where Sean added the physics of electrons into it. Uh, and uh, here is an example of a simulation just to show that we can actually compute what the electron temperature is doing robustly. Uh, interestingly, you see that 
So I'm showing here the uh, logarithm of electron temperature in the units of MEC squared, uh, rest mass energy of the electron. And you see that even though most of the accretion flow is blue, which means that the electrons are non-relativistic, uh, as you would expect in the accretion disk, maybe mildly relativistic, uh, the electrons near the polar regions, and the polar regions are becoming quite hot, and this is what uh, is good for seeing the jets. So perhaps when we look at the jets, we actually see not the center uh, of the jet, but this sheath of hot electrons which have been heated up by the turbulence in the accretion disk. Uh, you can make uh, spectra which uh, agree with the observed spectra of Sagittarius A star well. Uh, you can make the images uh, and you can try and backtrack uh, from this physically motivated model uh, what the properties of the accretion flow are and test whether our understanding of the heating uh, mechanism of electrons is actually a correct one uh, by, by seeing if um, variations in the heating, for instance, a constant heating fraction independent of plasma beta parameter, uh, would do a good job of reproducing the spectra and the time variability. Uh, let me wrap up uh, with uh, uh, the discussion of what happens when the jets run into the ambient medium and uh, produce fireworks at the larger scales of the galaxy or even the galaxy clusters uh, at tens to hundreds uh, of kiloparsecs. So here is an X-ray image uh, with the radio contours overlaid of an M87 jet. Uh, the X-rays are from Chandra. And here is a zoom in, uh, and in of the optical image, the same, the same source but in the optical wavelengths, uh, also of M87 with the Hubble telescope. And you can see that the jet shows a, a number of knots. Uh, there is the central core, which is uh, where the black hole is hiding, then there is the first knot, which is called HST1. Not surprisingly, HST saw it first, and so here, here you go, HST1. And then there are alphabetically ordered knots, D, E, F, I. A probably was the first one, so that's why it's further out. It's the brightest one. But you can see that there is a kind of periodic um, structure in these knots. Uh, and uh, the question is, what causes the jets to shine at these large, large scales where they start interacting with the ambient medium? This is five or six orders of magnitude away from the black hole. So if one gravitational radius is one, uh, this distance to HST1 is one million. Um, and what do we expect to happen? Well, the black hole is at the very center. Uh, there is a Christian disk uh, that rains down on it, uh, and it produces um, an outflow. Um, and that collimates the jet. And this jet eventually propagates as far as it can, and then it realizes that it leaves the sphere of influence of the black hole where there is the ISM. So when it runs into the ISM, uh, it uh, receives a jolt, it pinches, undergoes a few recollimations, and then settles down into something that is more structured. Incidentally, these recollimations could be uh, these uh, uh, structures that we've seen that are quasi-periodic. Um, what uh, makes us think that this is the actually right picture? There are indications that there is something happening at around the Bondi radius, uh, the, around the sphere of influence of the black hole. The shape of the M87 jet, that's the cross-sectional radius of the jet, and this is the deprojected distance along the jet. Uh, they follow uh, a nearly perfectly parabolic shape until the Bondi radius, and then the jet becomes conical after that. So it's as if there is something uh, dramatic happening to the jet and its structure is changing at that radius. Uh, so let me show you uh, what uh, we can do in order to try and understand what's happening uh, in the system. Uh, here is a, a bird's eye view of the same M87 jet. That's the same uh, structure that we saw, just zoomed out on a larger scale. You already saw this slide. Um, and the center of this galaxy is a 10 billion solar mass black hole. And there is another one, just for contrast to show you, um, also 10 billion solar mass black hole, but it produces a jet of completely different morphology. In fact, the distance uh, out to which this jet is able to propagate here is 70 kiloparsecs, way outside of the galaxy. Um, and here it's only 5 kiloparsecs, which is well inside the galaxy. Um, and the question that I'm going to try and address here is, what makes this jet so different? 
what causes this jet to apparently stall and disrupt completely, whereas this one is happily propagating over to large distances. This is crucial to understand, because maybe differences in the ambient medium are telling us something about the central engine physics. Maybe these jets are completely different in their nature, and that's why they're behaving differently. Or maybe it's something else. Uh, maybe it's the ambient medium that's different between these two galaxies. Uh, what I'm going to explore is perhaps it's the magnetic instability acting in these jets that is affecting the way these jets appear, and that will allow us to back out what actually causes this morphological change. Um, and uh, when we talk about magnetic instability, let me give you a brief overview of what the magnetic instability is. Um, the instability in question here is a three-dimensional magnetic instability, uh, and this is, one, this is uh, what you heard about uh, when there was a discussion of tokamak plasmas. These instabilities are there, people have to deal with them, and we deal with them in astrophysical plasmas as well. So what is a kink instability? Magnetic fields wound up in a jet behave similar to a spring. If we take a spring and squish it between our fingers, the spring will fly away sideways. That is precisely the magnetic kink instability. Um, and in order to estimate whether a jet will be stable or not to that instability, we need to compare the time scale over which it grows to the time scale it takes for the parcel of fluid to propagate from the base to the tip of the jet. Uh, if this propagation time scale from the base to the tip of the jet is very short, there will be no time for the instability to grow. If uh, it takes very long for the propagation to happen compared to the instability growth time scale, the instability will disrupt the jet. So the instability growth time is very easy to estimate. It's the time it takes for an Alvin wave to communicate information around the jet. So it's the jet uh, perimeter, uh, 2 pi r of the jet, uh, divided by the Alvin speed, where in this case, I assume it's close to the speed of light, and multiplied by the magnetic pitch. Uh, the BP is the vertical field along the jet, and B phi is the toroidal field. So if, what does it mean? If our jet is tightly wound, B phi is very high, the jet will be more unstable. The time scale will be shorter. If BP is high, the jet is essentially straight field lines. There is nothing to go unstable. It's not a spring, it's a straight field line, and so it won't be unstable. So it makes sense uh, why the T kink is proportional to this magnetic pitch. And what we need to do is we need to compare this time scale to the travel time scale along the jet, uh, and uh, that is uh, given simply by the uh, radius of the jet head location divided by the speed of light. So if we divide this by that, we will get the stability parameter. If the stability parameter is less than one, the jet will be unstable. Um, if, the if the stability parameter is greater than one, it means that it takes longer for the kink instability to grow than uh, for the fluid to traverse the jet. Therefore, there will be no time for the instability to grow in the fluid frame. Uh, so uh, you can rewrite this instability parameter in this convenient form, and you see that um, there is a jet power that enters the numerator, uh, there is the ambient density, and the length of the jet square that enters the denominator. So long jets will be unstable, powerful jets will be stable, and high density ambient medium makes the jets unstable. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to send two jets of different powers into the same exact ambient medium, shown here. Um, it's about one uh, particle per cc at about one kiloparsec. Uh, it's a power low density decline uh, going in as r to the minus one. Uh, and then it abruptly decreases at 10 kiloparsecs, uh, which is the edge of uh, the central density. It actually happens a bit further, but for numerical reasons, it was easier for me to start it earlier. Uh, it doesn't really affect the results of the simulations qualitatively. And what is happening to the stability parameter uh, for Cygnus A, who has a 100 times more powerful jet, the, the instability parameter goes down uh, in this flat density profile and then goes up. Uh, and it always stays above one. So we expect that should be stable. And uh, the M87 jet um, becomes marginally unstable, just around 10 kiloparsecs. So let's look at the two simulations. I'm going to run them at the same time. Uh, this is the powerful jet, Cygnus A-like jet, and this is the lower power jet, M87-like jet, like jet, and they're propagating both in the same sort of ambient medium, the same exact ambient density profile. What I'm showing here is the magnetic field line, one magnetic field line traced from the center uh, for, um, along the jet, and the color shows the density. 
uh, blue is low density, yellow is higher density, red is high density. And what you can see is that these jets, they behave like bendable drills. They kind of try to drill into the wall or the ambient medium, but they kind of wiggle around. And uh, so if the jet is strong, it will be able to drill through the wall, even despite the wiggles. In a moment, we will see what happens to the weaker jet. Uh, hint, it will break up. Uh, another important uh, uh, thing to notice is that since the jet propagates so nicely and fast into the ambient medium, whatever exhaust, the jet material that comes out of it, uh, is lagging behind and flowing back along the jet, uh, very similar to what we've seen in the observations. Uh, in the case of low-power jet, uh, even though the two simulations have been run for the same time, uh, it has reached only about 5 kiloparsecs, just about the distance that we see M87 jet stalled at. This is a 10 kiloparsec circle in both cases. And you can see the jet is having real trouble making it out, even though there is really no, no structure, no wall, no anything. It's just a simple power low density profile. So the, way, the reason why the jet stalls is the magnetic kink instability. Uh, this is the distance where the jet becomes unstable, and the magnetic kink goes nonlinear and disrupts the jet. Uh, this instability goes on for a very long time. The jet is stalled for uh, about several million years, uh, which is actually comparable to the outburst of M87 uh, as inferred from the observations. Uh, oh, and another important thing here is that uh, you can see that in this simulation, because the jet was stalled, its exhaust was outrunning the jet because the jet can propagate uh, the pieces of the jet that break off. They, they go forward as opposed to going backwards. So that is another morphological uh, that is the other morphological uh, feature that the simulations naturally reproduce. So let me summarize. Um, I started with discussing uh, what sets the connection between accretion flow and the jets. And what I found is that, um, or at least I hope I convinced you, that dynamically important magnetic fields are widespread. Uh, and if you give a black hole as much magnetic flux as it would take, it would produce a really robust jet that is nearly impossible to kill. And that's actually a problem. Um, the magnetically arrested disks um, are what happens to the disk when the magnetic field is dynamically important. The disk is broken up and very violent. Um, and uh, uh, the outflows from these disks give the upper limit, the upper envelope of what you expect to have in the form of outflows and jet power from an accretion disk at a given mass accretion rate. Um, if there is no rotation in the disk, that's the only way I was able to kill the jet. Uh, actually not kill it, but suppress the power below the mad level. So that's actually a problem. Once you give a lot of magnetic flux to the black hole, how do you get rid of it? How do you switch off the jet like we see nature does? Uh, one interesting uh, new development is that you don't need large-scale vertical magnetic fields in order to produce jets. You, you can get away with purely toroidal fields. So we're seeing large-scale poloidal dynamo producing jets. And uh, looking at larger scales, we're now starting to begin to gain understanding of what sets large-scale jet morphology. How does it connect to the properties of the ambient medium and the power of the jet? So just by changing the jet power for the same exact ambient medium, we can switch the jets from being stable to unstable. And that might explain uh, a 40-year-long puzzle about what causes the dichotomy of the jets, some being long and straight and the other ones falling apart. Thank you very much.